Hey everybody, and we're back for drum breaks video number two. So uh, we are going to go back to our screen share. Oops, sorry, wrong one. And now we're on the different types of drums. Uh, I know I briefly discussed drum cooling, I believe, uh, briefly. Um, but I wanna get into a little bit more detail than I did before. So first things first, uh, a lot of the common ones were, uh, back in the day especially, were solid cast iron. Um, a lot of manufacturers then went to steel and iron. You'll notice no matter what type, even the bimetallic aluminum, the friction surface inside of the drum, the part that the shoes actually touch when they move out, is generally always gonna be cast iron. And that is because of the way it dissipates heat, the way it handles heat. It is heavy, which is why a lot of manufacturers went to using different material for the outside of the drum. Uh, cast iron um, has a good coefficient of friction, but it is really heavy, um, so there is that. A lot of you may have questions on, well, why aren't we seeing, how, how come drum brakes have been around for this long and we have not seen them make any performance style drum brake? That is because it's a drum brake. So if you really want some serious performance, um, steady performance, consistent performance, um, less fade type of performance, you're going to convert to a disc brake design. And most companies have made it so easy that there's really no point to buying performance drums because the amount of money you'd end up spending, you could have just converted to a disc brake design. So uh, the biometallic aluminum is going to be your best bet for performance on a drum. But again, um, we're looking at more expensive and so manufacturers aren't really going that route. Um, instead, they're just doing disc brake designs on their more sporty vehicles. Oops, doesn't want to let me, there we go. <clears throat> you probably have seen on larger drum designs, especially uh, when you see it on big trucks, possibly even old cars though, um, a lot of those larger drum designs you can see have either ribs or fins on them. They are for cooling. However, the, even though they might look kind of like fan fins on um, some of them, um, they don't act like that. That's not how it cools, uh, which is kind of, I mean, if you looked at the axial rib design, you'd be like, how the hell does it cool if it's not acting like that? Uh, all of these designs, the cross fins or the axial ribs, they're simply providing more surface area to touch air to get rid of heat. That's, that's it. Uh, rather than making the actual drum larger, they actually created waves on it to create more surface area in order for uh, the air to cool the drum. And so that's where those came in. The axial ribs run parallel around the entire drum, um, while the cross fins are sort of perpendicular uh, running across the drum surface. Um, a lot of the time, drums with these types of designs are a little bit more structurally sound, and so you see a lot less bell mouth type of issues and, and stuff like that, um, but they are still susceptible to fade even though they have these cooling provisions if they do get hot enough, so that's just something to keep in mind. When you're removing drums, uh, something uh, that you may come across is going to be the drum doesn't wanna come off. So, um, you're pulling and tugging and tugging. So the first thing that I really want to mention is going to be, and let's take us out of screen share here for a moment because I don't know that I have this on the slide. Um, so when we're looking at how to take a drum off, there's a couple different things that you should double check. First things first, you need to double, triple, quadruple check uh, and make sure the parking brake is off or disengaged. Um, so many times I've seen students have a really big issue with, man, I just can't get these drums off. Double check your parking brakes. So many people leave them on because it's just, uh, it, it, it's a habit to turn the parking brake on when you go to lift a vehicle, um, especially in the jack and jack stands and stuff like that. Just, it, it's sort of second nature to some of us. Um, and so you might not even realize that you did it. 
So make sure your parking brake is off. Next thing is, um, I like to spray PV Blaster. Um, and that's not me trying to plug their brand or anything like that. You can use any type of penetrant. I just, PV Blaster happens to be my go-to. Um, you're gonna want to spray PB around the center of where the drum sort of sits on the hub, as well as where the lug studs are. I found that this helps out a ton if you have any surface rest that's binding the drum together um, to release that. Uh, then from there, you are gonna want to either do one of two things. So I always try to work smarter, not harder. Um, do what you have around with you. Um, if you've got a pocket screwdriver and uh, or, or a, uh, a drum brake adjustment tool, uh, go through the back side and I'll show you a picture here and a few of the drum and try to unadjust the drum. Um, the star wheel adjuster needs two screwdrivers to unadjust it. So what you need, what you're trying to do really, because what happens is the shoes will wear and the adjuster pushes them out further and further. Problem is, is sometimes they will wear a lip in the drum. And so when you go to pull the drum off, there's a lip that's catching behind the shoes and it wants to pull the shoes off with it, but your shoes have retaining springs, so they don't want to come off and so on and so forth. So what you want to do is take those shoes and pull them in, unadjust them, if you will. So you can pull the drum off and around that lip that's catching on the shoes. Sometimes this requires a whole lot of unadjustment depending on how large that lip is and how long it's been since anybody's had a drum off of those. Um, another thing you could do, but this, this only works if there's not a lip. Um, I'm going to go back to screen share here. Um, Whoa, wrong one. A lot of times manufacturers will put little threaded holes on the face of the drum. This is a lifesaver if you have that. Uh, thank you to all the manufacturers who do that because what you can use is a bolt. Pretty much uh, most all of the ones that I've come across that do have that. Uh, there are different thread pitches, but for the most part, they're eight by 1.25 thread pitch is the most common I found on these. Um, Honda does this a lot, uh, a lot of manufacturers will do this. Um, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the two holes and you're gonna put an eight by 1.25 bolt through those holes and you are going to snug the bolt down. As you snug the bolt down, the bolt is going to push through the other side of the drum and is going to sort of push the drum off of the surface there um, and hopefully break away from the lip uh, if it's, you know, close enough, if there's any surface rust, it's going to help break that surface rust. Um, you can do this with a power tool or you can do it with a hand tool. Um, just be careful because if the drum is really struck, stuck, you will just, th uh, you will just strip those threads. And now you, that, that part of the drum is useless and you'll have to go and recut those threads and so on and so forth. So that's a really nice resource. Uh, but when I was talking about the PB blaster, so you're gonna wanna spray it around here. And usually on, I like to spray it on each of the lug studs because that's where it sort of sits flat on the, the hub face. And it can break, that penetrant can break away uh, any of that surface rust. So, the, those are a few of the strategies that I like to use when you're removing drum brakes. I will talk a little bit more about unadjusting here when we get to star wheel adjusters. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. Perfect. So, uh, like I mentioned, a lot of times the shoes are simply worn into the drum, creating a lip. So, in order to get the drum off of the shoes, you need to unadjust the shoes so they become smaller in diameter and um, then you can pull the drum off. So if we're looking at the star wheel gesture up from the front, this is what it looks like down here in the bottom picture. So I've got a star wheel or a little, what looks like a little gear that's threaded into the other part of the adjuster. And as the shoes wear down, this adjuster will adjust outward and the threads will move outward. That star wheel is able to move and spin separately from the other piece here. Now what keeps it from moving it back is this little lever here, this parking brake lever. 
um, that sort of sits on those teeth and those teeth are directional. So it won't let the star wheel move back, but it will let it move forward, allowing the shoes to come out. Now, if you want to move it back, you need it. And we're looking at the top picture here. You're going to need a screwdriver to push that lever up and off. And then you're going to use a another either another screwdriver or if you have a brake adjusting the brake adjusting tool is like a screwdriver that has a little angle almost like a pry bar so you could use the second tool to move the star wheel backward pulling the shoes in and this one's sort of trial and error um i always just do it a bunch uh just to see where where the shoes are at um because when you put the new shoes on anyways you're going to have to re uh, adjust the the adjuster so it's not that big of a deal um, you're just gonna need to unadjust those if you want to remove the drums uh, I, you have to do this so much so there's a little window on the back side let me see if I've got another picture here I don't think I do sorry I should have put a picture on here um, nope nope so on the back side of this drum, look at the bottom picture here where my mouse is. There is a little window. Wherever the adjuster is, your drum brake pack, uh, your drum brake backing plate should have a little oval window that will usually have a, a black rubber grommet inside of it. Um, and what you're gonna do is use a screwdriver to sort of pull that grommet off and you can have access in there, kind of like how our screwdrivers are positioned in that. So you'd stick the two screwdrivers in one would be pushing the lever, the other would be unadjusting the, the star wheel. So that would be the best way on how to do that. Sorry, I don't have a better picture here for you. I will try to see if I can put a video in the uh, resource video portion. The actual backing plate does, uh, it actually has a couple of jobs. So one big thing it does is it's sort of a splash shield to keep any contaminants from uh, entering the drum brake assembly, touching the shoes, keeps water and crap out, um, which is nice. The only problem is, is sometimes when things get inside, they have a hard time getting out, especially things like water. Uh, your wheel cylinder and your shoes are going to be attached to the backing plate. So up at the top, your wheel cylinder is generally attached with two little bolts or nuts that hold it in. Uh, your wheel cylinder is usually not super hard to take out. In fact, when we come back uh, from this mess and we get into lab, I will definitely get um, get you get you guys a lab to where you guys can uh, take this all of this apart, put it back together. Um, your shoes are, and I mentioned this already a few slides ago um, in the last video, are held in by retaining springs. One retaining spring on each side is generally how they're held in. Uh, the shoes also, when they move out and in, um, they are going to slide up against the backing plate. So there are grease points in which you're going to want to lube the backing plate. When you take the shoes off, it's easy to see there's usually like three raised areas, uh, two or three raised areas on each side that the shoes sort of move up against. Just take a light, thin coat of grease and grease those so you get less noise and the shoes don't bind up. Uh, and all that good stuff. Here's a good picture of our grease points here. Um, so you're going to want to check your backing plate for damage, anything like that, cracking, bends, stuff like that. But here's our support pads here, here, and here is three. Here's another three. This one's actually sort of textured here. Um, so what you're going to do is just take a light coat of grease and sort of grease those little pads so the shoes uh, can move freely on there without making all kinds of noise or getting jammed up. Um, your wheel cylinder is actually a very basic design. Let me see if I actually, I don't have any other pictures here. So I'm going to take a set of screen share for a moment so I can show you what a wheel cylinder looks like. So if I have a wheel cylinder, I'm going to draw it just as sort of like a rectangle here, but it is sort of a tube. Um, and I'm going to draw an x-ray version of this. So uh, hopefully it makes sense. I am going to have a little hydraulic outlet here for the fluid to come in when you press on the brake pedal. Um, in another color in green here, I'll go ahead and show that we actually are going to have um, some cup seals here. Oops.
Those cup seals do look like a little cup. When we get into lab, I'm gonna show you exactly how they look like. Um, I, I, I think I even have a picture of a cup seal inside of uh, the PowerPoint, so I'll show you in a few. So you've got these little cup seals that are sort of facing each other. And then I'm going to have these little round shim looking pistons uh, on the other side of the cup seal. The pistons don't seal. Um, they're not a sealing surface, kind of like your caliper uh, was. Instead, it's your cup seal sets your sealing surface. And then on the inside, I usually, um, and this depends on the design, I don't always have this, but on mo most modern wheel cylinders, they'll have these little um, metal pieces that fit inside the cup seal called expanders and a spring that attaches them oops, to hold everything sort of in place. It's to keep those cups from uh, not necessarily deflating, but sort of um, collapsing because these cups keep fluid from moving outward. Uh, and the cup expander, like I said, is also going to have a spring in here. So it's going to keep everything expanded. Now on the outside, I use all my colors, so I'll use green again here. I'm generally going to have some sort of dust boot. Have a little hole here and here um, because our pistons will usually have some sort of extension on them that sort of move out here through our dust boots. This is not the greatest picture, but uh, those dust boots keep any contaminants from getting inside our wheel cylinder surface where the pistons are and the cup seals are. Um, what can happen is when these cup seals go bad, uh, we'll say that um, our fluid is blue. Uh, so let's say, let's say these cup seals go bad and it lets fluid back out here. Our dust boots aren't necessarily going to seal any fluid from coming out. They're just to keep stuff from coming in. So fluid may start leaking out of our wheel cylinder. Well, that's a big problem because our wheel cylinder is right next to the shoes. And even if it doesn't drip onto the shoes, it drips all the way down to the bottom of the drum. Well, the drum is going to spin. So whatever drips to the bottom of the drum is going to get on the shoes. And if you remember correctly, if we get any fluid on our shoes, it's contamination, right? So contamination is going to lock up our brakes uh, because the shoes get really sticky when they get any grease or fluid on them. So you will absolutely get um, some really bad issues. I've had really, really, really bad leaky wheel cylinders to where it's draining pretty much the entire system. Um, so the, the pads, or I'm sorry, the shoes get so soaked and wet uh, that they actually just don't break at all. Um, but before that happens, light contamination will actually cause sticky shoes while well, really, really heavy contamination may have a tendency to just cause no breaking at all, um, just no coefficient of friction. So uh, that's something you're gonna wanna look at. Let's go back to our screen share here um, and finish this up before we start a new video here. So you are going to, um, a good practice would be to pull the dust boot away just to see if there's any leakage, but usually underneath our wheel cylinder here, there will be a uh, wet fluid usually. Uh, it's not hard to tell if a wheel cylinder is leaking. Um, you either need to rebuild it, which I'll show you guys how to do, but just like the caliper rebuild, uh, it's not great practice to do on a customer vehicle because now you hold liability. But on your vehicle, so cheap and easy to do. Um, I'll show you guys, it really, as long as you have the correct tools, it really only takes a few minutes to rebuild a set of wheel cylinders. The only problem is, is you can only rebuild cast iron wheel cylinders, no aluminum or anodized wheel cylinders. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that when I do the demonstration in the lab. Um, and I think before we get heavy into the next, um, I'll do one more slide here and then we'll, we'll start a new video. So checking the linings and shoes for their condition, what we're checking for is any scoring, um, meaning has anything worn a groove inside of the shoe, any glazing. So the shoe should not have a mirror finish. Uh, it shouldn't be super shiny. If it glazed, it got overheated, and now it's not going to have a very good uh, coefficient of friction. 
Um, sometimes you can get away with sanding them down, but I never recommend that, at least without any breathing protection or respiratory protection, because you never know where those shoes were made. If they contain asbestos, and when you sand shoes, uh, it, you're gonna create dust. Um, and you're not gonna wanna wet that dust down because you don't wanna contaminate your shoes. So it's sort of, uh, uh, just buy new shoes, especially for a customer vehicle. Um, any cracking, uh, like you see here in the picture, that's, that's pretty bad. What we don't want is a chunk of shoe coming off while we're actually driving the vehicle. So if you've got a lot of cracking on the shoes, I highly recommend that you replace those shoes. Uh, and then obviously measure them with lining thickness gauges that we use when we did our initial inspections in class. Um, if it's super worn down or it's worn down to the rivets on riveted type shoes, you need to change them. Um, and I, I just mentioned insufficient thickness, so there's that. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's start a new video for star wheel adjusters. So we'll go ahead and catch on the flip side.